Chapter 4 of The Blue Cat of Castletown by Catherine Kate Koblenz. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Eastman. Chapter 4 John Gilroy, the Weaver. Mr. Gilroy had a loom on which was woven the twin tablecloths. A man who knew the weaver declares that he drew some of his designs for these tablecloths from old buildings in the town. From an old newspaper. Now if I were just an ordinary kitten, I wouldn't have such a time to find a hearth, thought the blue kitten, remembering what his mother had told him. But she had never told him about the three black hairs in the end of his tail, so he did not dream for an instant that he might, after all, turn out to be an ordinary cat. To be sure, his mother had said this might happen, and the river had suggested it. But the blue kitten felt in his very bones that he was a superior creature. So even while he mewed plaintively his wish to be ordinary, he didn't for an instant consider such a frightful possibility. In the morning, when the mist lifted, he decided to continue straight along the way he had come. As it grew lighter, he paused to look at one or two houses as a possible home. He even jumped on the window sill to peer inside what turned out to be a hatter's shop. He did want to be satisfied this time. Comfort made such a difference in a kitten's life. While if he ever lived to be old, it might mean even more. He had come nearly to the center of the settled mile of road of which the river had told, when he saw a small house. Over the door was a swinging sign. John Gilroy, Weaver. And standing beneath that sign, with his head nearly touching it, was a tall, rather thin man. The kitten saw that his hair was black and curly, his eyes a curious blue, which turned to gray now and then. He saw, too, that this mortal's face was deeply lined. Suffering and sorrow, the kitten's mother had said, made such lines on mortals' faces. Sometimes they were good lines. Sometimes they were bad. The lines on this man's face, the kitten knew at once, were good lines. Even before he heard the man speaking, he felt that his chances of finding a hearth here were good, too. Very good indeed. John Gilroy was talking to two women who stood before him. At the same time, he was stroking with his long, sensitive fingers some hanks of silken white. The kitten stood beside the two women to listen. Good flax yarn, the weaver was saying, the work of a whole year. Aye, said the older woman. Flax sewed last May, as my mother taught me. The younger woman, who still held her yarn on one arm, smiled, and her eyes took on a faraway look, so that the blue kitten gazing up at her understood she was seeing the very sewing. The older woman went on. I myself ran the flax through the rippling comb to shell off the seeds, and soaked it in the brook by the kitchen door until it was soft. I helped with the breaking and the swingling, until all the harsh part of the stalk was gone, and ran it through the hatchling comb to take out the short fibers. Oh, this was a task! But the spinning was another matter. Dear me, thought the blue kitten, how tiresome a woman can be! He looked at the weaver, and was astonished that the man did not seem to find the woman tiresome in the least. Instead, he was watching her face, as though her words were something he had hungered for. Another matter? he asked as the woman paused. Aye, the spinning I did between heavy tasks, to rest myself. She hesitated and seemed to search for words. There is dignity in spinning, she added. 
She looked down at her hands wonderingly, as though astonished that they should have had part in fashioning the hanks of linen yarn, which John Gilroy the weaver held so lightly on one arm. "'I would like to look inside your house to see whether it pleases me,' mewed the blue kitten to the weaver. But no one paid the slightest attention. Instead, the younger woman with a far-off look in her eyes broke in suddenly. "'The fields were so lovely, blue and then gold. Is it not a strange thing that the thread is so white? I made up a song about it to hum at my spinning. Here I am, spinning, spinning, white yarn my fingers yield, though all the while I'm spinning, spinning, blue flowers in a golden field. You bleached the flax well, praised the weaver. One does not throw away lightly the work of a year, said the first woman. Nor the beauty, added the second. But why, questioned the weaver, have you come to me? You must know that I weave woolen yarn only, and spend most of my time working for Aruna Hyde. He pays very well. You are the best weaver in Castletown, said the first woman, and we want only the best. Besides, added the second, you come from Ireland. All Irish weavers can weave linen yarn. Make Aruna wait. I, agreed the first, more sharply, make him wait. Wait? Aruna? The weaver looked astonished. We have worked hard, reminded the first woman. We want to remember this year forever, said the second, very gently. By this time, the blue kitten, who felt he was doing the waiting, began purring the song of the river. After all, he had listened long enough. Were the fields very blue? asked the weaver, not paying any attention to the purring at his feet. Blue as the sea itself, and golden as the sands, said the second woman. She began to hum her weaving song once more, only this time she said, Blue sea and golden sands. Then it is fitting that the thread be as it is, as white as the surf, said the weaver. The surf is the thread of the sea. Now what do you want me to weave for you? Tablecloths. The two women spoke together, and the first added, Neither of us has ever had a white cloth, and a white cloth on the table does something to a house. There is a holiness about it, such as one feels in a church at communion time. The second nodded. By this time, the kitten was halfway through the river's song, and in the silence which followed, the purr could be heard plainly. Riches will pass, and power, beauty remains, sing your own song. Now that the kitten saw John Gilroy was really listening, he took full advantage. Out of yesterday song comes, it goes into tomorrow. Long ago in Ireland I planned, began the weaver. So it is agreed. The second woman said nothing, but thrust her hanks of yarn on the man's other arm, which came up to receive the light burden. Then the women turned, and with a rustle of skirts and petticoats, hurried out to the chaise by the roadside, where an old brown mare had been waiting patiently. The older woman climbed in after the younger, gathered up the reins, and chirped with her lips. At the sound, the old brown mare started off. The sound of the hoofs of the mare plodding along the dirt road, and the creaking of the off-hind wheel kept perfect time to the purring of the blue kitten, still sitting under the sign of the weaver, and playing with a skein of linen yarn which brushed his nose. With your life fashion beauty. 
Well, I might as well. For once, Puskins, said John Gilroy, lifting the yarn out of the kitten's reach. You have a nice purr. Come in and make yourself comfortable. It was as easy as that. When your bones tell you that you are a superior creature, you should trust them. The kitten breakfasted, amply if not richly, on some crumbled johnny cake and bacon grease. And all the while the weaver stood stroking the linen yarn. "'Tis as fine as the silk I handled in Cathay, Puskins." The kitten reached up and pricked the man's knee gently with his claw to show that he understood. The weaver put the yarn down and took up the kitten instead. I think I shall put into the tablecloth a certain pagoda I remember. The kitten began to purr. Riches will pass and power. Beauty remains. The weaver stroked the purring kitten's head. Well, you are right, Puskins. The pagoda has probably been scattered to the four winds of heaven, and the ship on which I journeyed from Ireland to Cathay is lying on the corals, with mermaids sleeping in its berths and swimming in and out the portholes. And yet I have both ship and pagoda still. I can weave them into the tablecloths and keep them forever. And the women will be pleased. They are unusual women, Puskins. I think they were born with beauty and peace and content in their hearts. Come, let us go for a walk. That was better. The kitten was not interested in hearing about women. I am to weave their tablecloths, Puskins, said the weaver as they went out the door, so I must picture some of the things they have known and loved all their lives. That morning John Gilroy made many drawings in Castletown, and the kitten listened as the man worked. He waved his tail appreciatively back and forth. This is the old Remington Tavern, said the man. I shall put that in the cloth. Its lines are simple. Its roof is low. I have seen its like in Ireland. Men talked here of liberty, and from this tavern they went forth to make their words more than words. People eating from these tablecloths and seeing the old tavern will recall the taking of Fort Ticonderoga without a shot in the name of Jehovah and the Continental Congress. And those who know the story of Castletown will tell then of Samuel Beach, who walked and ran sixty miles over hills and through valleys to call volunteers to this tavern. Sixty miles is a walk, Puskins. In Massachusetts at that time, a man named Revere rode through the night to rouse men to fight for liberty. But in Vermont, a man walked. That, too, should be remembered. Mew! Mew! agreed the blue kitten. Now this is the first medical school in Vermont. They say it will soon be closed, but it will be seen on the tablecloths forever. The weaver sketched, too, the cobbler's shop and the old church on the village green. They are building a new church soon, he explained, and this building is really not at all beautiful. Yet for these women in Castletown, the old church has meant much, so it shall go in their tablecloths. Mew, agreed the kitten. Then the pair of them went back to the weaver's shop. The loom was filled with an ugly cloth of black and white mingled together. Woolen cloth for Aruna, said the weaver, his favorite pepper and salt. What a joy it will be to weave linen and forget the man. He cut the half-woven woolen from the loom and threw the mingled mass of cloth and yarn in a pile in a corner of the room. The kitten found the pile soft and comfortable and curled down contentedly, singing his song. 
After a time, John Gilroy began to sing, a song which went with the pattern growing beneath his fingers, went with the sound of the treadle, the thump of the baton pressing the warp more firmly against the woof. It wasn't the song of the river, not yet. But the kitten remembered that Ebenezer Southmaid had been some time learning the song, though he had known it before. Thread over and under, thread three over and under, two over and under, now here is the steeple, for folk to remember, for ever and ever. Sing well, said the river, sing well. Linen threads crossing, the loom shuttles tossing, knot on the wrong side, and thread pressed down firmly, something to keep through the spring and the winter, yesterday held in the thread of my weaving, yesterday deep in the song of a kitten, yesterday held by a life weaving beauty. Sing well, said the river, sing well. Sometimes there was a bit more from the river's song, slipped into the weaver's song, and at such times the kitten thought John Gilroy was surely learning. Yet at other times he seemed to have forgotten the river's song entirely. Then one morning the kitten, who was becoming discouraged, drew a quick breath of relief. For the weaver opened his lips and began to sing, a trifle haltingly to be sure, another whole line of the river's song. Out of yesterday song comes, it goes into tomorrow. After these cloths are finished, the weaver promised the kitten, I will do another, and into that one, Puskins, I shall put all the beauty and joy of yesterday, all the dreams I once had of tomorrow. New words came into John Gilroy's singing that morning and there was something about the very look on the man's face that made the blue kid uncertain that in a few minutes, a very few minutes, the weaver would sing loudly and joyfully the song of the river. Seeing the light growing on the man's face, he was, the kid understood, singing straight toward that song. Here I sit weaving and weaving, the linen threads flashing away. Dunk, 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 here I sit weaving and dreaming, from Castletown clear to Cathay. Dunk, 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 dunk. But just as John Gilroy flung his head back with the words, Sing your song, as luck or fate or something would have it, there was the sound of a horse being ridden hard, a gallop which stopped suddenly at a sharp order by the weaver's very door. There was the click of spurs on the doorstone, and a demanding rapidy rap, rapidy rap, rap 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 on the door. The blue kitten, lying on the pile of discarded woolen cloth and yarn, held up his head. And he saw that the weaver, who was working on the last border of the second tablecloth, looked startled. Without waiting for the door to be opened, the rider, the one who had knocked so sharply with the butt-end of his riding-whip opened it himself and strode into the room. Everything about the tall newcomer was dark and harsh. His clothes, his hair, his beard, even his eyes were dark and somber. And it seemed as though a dark cloud, too, was about him, so that the very sunlight in the weaver's cottage dimmed. The kitten, who by this time felt he knew mortals very well, had never seen one such as this. "'Quick, Gilroy,' said the man brusquely, "'I have come for my cloth, my pepper and salt. You should have brought it to me and saved my time. I must have a new suit made of it at once, and the tailor must hurry, for I shall wear the suit when I sign the contract for the Lightning Express.' "'Express? What was that?' questioned the kitten to himself. The man's breath came as fast as his words. He had thrown down the whip, and now he opened and shut his hands as though wanting them to be filled with something, which must be very important, the kitten judged, so agitated was the newcomer's manner. Quick, 
he demanded, where is the cloth? Instinctively, the kitten had inched himself beneath a fold of the discarded woolen material, so that only one amber eye looked forth. That eye, however, watched with astonishment as the weaver seemed to shrivel and grow smaller in the presence of the dark one. Even the lines of the weaver's face seemed to change, and the corners of his mouth grew lax. He stood in front of his loom, as though to hide the weaving from the other's sight. Why, decided the kitten, the weaver was afraid. One mortal afraid of another. But even as he came to this conclusion, he saw the weaver's hands begin to shake. Quick! demanded the other, the cloth. But, but, came from John Gilroy. Do you mean to say my order is not ready? demanded the other. What is that you are doing? He had picked up the whip, and now he pointed with it toward the loom. I, I have been singing my own song, sir, came from the poor weaver. Singing your own song? What do you mean? Weaving such tablecloths as will live forever. See, are they not beautiful enough for a king? Stuff and nonsense! The whip cracked in the air, and the weaver quailed as though he had been struck, while the kitten thrust himself a little deeper in his hiding place, so only the merest slit of an eye watched the room. Prettiness will bring you little money. I will pay you double what I promised, but the pepper and salt must be ready in time. The dark one put his hands in his pocket and drew out gold, carelessly and generously enough, flinging the coins on the woven linen. You work for me, Aruna Hyde, he said. Aruna Hyde? Why, that was one of the names on the river's list. It was the blue kitten's turn to quail. Well, he would never enter this man's door, river list or no river list. That was certain. But the weaver was picking up the coins, was bending contritely before the dark Aruna. Yes, sir, he was saying, it shall be done. His mouth looked very weak indeed, decided the kitten. Not only were his shoulders stooped and all his tallness gone from him, but the very lines of his face were changed. You shall have the cloth soon, sir, he said. I will hurry. After Aruna Hyde had left, it was as though the darkness he had brought with him stayed behind in the weaver's cottage. At last the weaver spoke, slowly but definitely, as though he were held in the dark spell of Aruna's words. The tablecloth I hoped to do when these were finished was only a dream I had, a foolish dream, no doubt. Aruna says dreams are stuff and nonsense. Gold is shining and very real. Sing your own song, began the kitten hopefully. But the weaver opened the door and set the kitten outside. You must run along now, Puskins, he said. I have no time for listening to you. The blue kitten remained for a long while beneath the sign of the weaver, looking at the door shut firmly against him. He was dismayed. He was discouraged. Could it be possible, after all, that he was just an ordinary kitten? End of chapter 4